Welcome to Mayor Brown's Tech Talks podcast. Each podcast is designed to provide insights on legal issues relating to technology transactions and keep you up to date on the latest trends in data, digital, outsourcing, and software by drawing on the perspectives of practitioners who have executed technology transactions around the world. You can subscribe to this series on all major podcasting platforms. We hope you enjoy the program. Hello and welcome to Tech Talks. Our topic today, data transfers from Europe and beyond. How to think about the new EU standard contractual clauses and other changes in international data protection law. Uh, Businesses today are data driven and data dependent, but the rules that govern how data can be used and shared across borders are becoming increasingly tricky for international organizations to navigate. They're subject to constantly evolving and often conflicting requirements in each region, Uh, none more so than in Europe, where changes over the last 18 months or so have made it increasingly more difficult for organizations to transfer personal data from Europe to places like the United States. We'll talk today about these changes and a few things businesses can do to stay on top of them. I'm your host, Julian DeBell. I am a senior associate in Mayor Brown's technology transactions practice. Uh, Joining me today are my colleagues, Vivek Mohan and Oliver Yaros. Vivek is a partner in our cybersecurity and data privacy practice in Northern California. Oliver is a partner in the intellectual property and IT group based in our London office. Uh, so Oliver, let me turn to you first. You're, you're closer to the action. Uh, can you tell us about some of the changes that have occurred in Europe uh, over the last 18 months or so that have made data transfers coming out of Europe um, much more difficult? Cool. Uh, thanks, Julian. And hello, everyone. Um, so I think Europe is a is a good example of some of the difficult challenges that a lot of businesses are facing with respect to data flows, with respect to the use of personal data. It's becoming a much more complicated picture internationally, and, and Europe has obviously been a source of concern for a lot of businesses seeking to transfer personal data. Uh, internationally for many years, particularly in a tech transactions uh, context, but you can you can see it setting a trend for data flow issues in other parts of the world as, as well. Over the last 18 months, there have been a number of developments in Europe that have made it much more difficult to transfer personal data about people in Europe around the world, whether organizations want to use that within their business around the world or want to share it with with counterparties. I think the the biggest um, development was, of course, the Schrems 2 decision at the Court of Justice of the European Union in July 2020, which was all about the mechanisms used under European data protection law to allow businesses to transfer personal data from Europe to places outside of Europe, like the the US. Two major mechanisms that businesses use, one was the EU-US Privacy Shield for transfers of personal data to the US, if organizations in the US were self-certified to that. And another mechanism, which most organizations used, was standard contractual clauses, these template clauses that approved by the European Commission that organisations can use to transfer data. Um, In the Schrems 2 decision, uh, it was held that the EU-US Privacy Shield couldn't form a legal basis for transfers from Europe to the US because it didn't provide enough protections um, to the the European standard. And um, there were provisions in standard contractual clauses that were challenged that required the exporters of data and the importers of data to conduct an assessment of the local laws in the importer's country to make sure that the importer could comply with the European standard. And the Schrems 2 decision held that that those were real requirements. A lot of businesses 
kind of ignored those requirements in standard contractual clauses, but the decision upheld those as being a real exercise that businesses need to do. So although the standard contractual clauses were maintained, the upshot of Schrems II was that it was going to become much more difficult to conduct transfers from Europe to, to the US and other places because an assessment had to be done of the legal regime in the recipient country to make sure that the European requirements could be could be satisfied. So that thing that made things quite quite difficult for many businesses and left a lot of businesses scratching their heads about how they were actually going to do this assessment. And it wasn't until the European Data Protection Board in November of 2020 published some draft uh, recommendations around what issues businesses should take into account when doing that legal assessment. The recommendations were finalised in June 2021, and it essentially boils down to three things. Businesses have to conduct this local law and practices assessment in the country where the data is transferred to. You have to do a transfer impact assessment before transferring the data out of Europe to a recipient country. They have to think about whether additional security measures are needed to protect the data once it's received in the country, like encryption or pseudonymization. And then if those would not um, protect the data that's being transferred from unlawful interference, as far as the European standard is concerned, the business then has to think very carefully about whether the data transfer can actually go ahead. So, it required businesses to jump through some extra hoops before actually doing these transfers. Another development that took place in June of this year was the approval of new standard contractual clauses that would replace the old ones that have been in, in, in situ for a long time. And in some ways, these are good because they're modular. They envisage a lot, a lot of different ways that businesses can use data because now there aren't just controller to controller sets or controller to processor sets, but there are two new ones, processor to processor and processor to controller. They're modular, so you can um, plug and play depending on what you want to do, but they do hardwire this, re this requirement to do a local law assessment um, into them. Um, and they also require more information to be provided when executing the standard contractual clauses around things like the security measures that have got to be adopted and what notification obligations the importers are going to have to comply with if a public authority in their country asks them to hand over the data. And there is a deadline by which these new SECs have to be adopted. So the old SECs can now no longer be used in any new agreements that are being entered into by organisations. The new SECs have got to be used um, and we've got to be put into existing contracts that might be using the old SECs by the 27th of December next year. So there's a lot of work for businesses to do to, to get ready for this new framework. And um, in order to do that, businesses need to be thinking about what their data flows are, what legal basis they're relying for the transfer and how they're going to do this local law assessment and repaper using the, the standard contractual clauses. So there's quite a lot of work to do as far as flows from Europe are concerned. Yeah, it sounds like uh, that's exactly right. There's a lot of items on uh, on businesses to do lists in order to get their data transfers from Europe in order. I'm curious for the for for the purpose of a, a business a person inside a business trying to understand why they're doing all this. So what do you think is driving these changes as far as Europe is concerned, sort of from a policy or political perspective? Yeah, I mean, there, there is obviously a bit of a, a political dimension to this as far as the, the Europeans are concerned. I mean, it starts from the from the viewpoint in Europe that the right to data privacy is, is a human right and it can't be given away in its entirety, it has to be balanced. And I think since the, you know, Edward Snowden revelations many years ago and the increasing uh, focus on the importance of data and sovereignty and, and rights of individuals, which is something you can see playing out in lots of different places around the world, 
that's why it's got it's got a heightened um, sensitivity in Europe now. You know how data about Europeans is being used internationally. So that's what that's what's driving these changes. There are some political there's a political dimension to it, and hopefully in the long term it will, it will get resolved. Uh, right. Well, and speaking of uh, political dimensions, there is another wrinkle to all this, which is that you know what, when these charges changes started getting underway, uh, the UK was still a part of the EU, um, and now it is no longer. What is the situation now for data transfers from the UK? Yeah. Well, it's it's a different picture. So. Um, the Brexit transition period ended on 31st of December 2020, and that's when EU law ceased to apply in the in the EU. So in the UK, we now have the UK GDPR, and um, transfers from the EU to the UK are allowed because the EU is given uh, the UK uh, adequacy status, and that will be reviewed in in four years' time, provided there are no dramatic changes in the UK. But transfers from the UK to other places like the US um, are, are still having to be done under the old SECs um, because the UK hasn't adopted the new EU SECs. There is a UK government consultation out at the moment which uh, suggests that there may be, the UK may have its own version of the SECs that businesses can use for transfers from the UK. And businesses may also be able to use the EU, the new EU version with an added extra UK annex added to it. So it'll be up to businesses to decide what they want to do. We don't know the outcome of that consultation yet. We won't know until the end of this year or beginning of next year, which or both of those are going to be adopted. But until then, you've got this mishmash where you've got the new EU SECs that have to be used for data transfers from the EU and the old EU SECs have to be used for data transfers from the UK and the trends to um, decision and the EDPB recommendations, the issues identified in those apply in both jurisdictions. So for the moment, two different approaches have to be taken with respect to the EU and the UK. And that's before you even get to the GDPR bonfire that the UK government is consulting on in the, in the UK, which may remove transfer restrictions from the UK to places like the US, but we'll have to see if that actually happens or not. Well, that's a lot to keep an eye on um, and, and you know, uh, sounds like a, a complicated set of issues for businesses to deal with if they are transferring personal data from both the UK and the EU, places like the US. Where do you think these rules are all headed. Do you think an agreement will be reached for data transfers to the US? And do you think things will get easier? I really hope so, Julian. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll be interested in Vivek's uh, view, view on this, but from the European side of things, I think that um, the, the European Commission and, and other um, governments all, all understand the value of data flows to places like the US and are keen for them to, to happen. But I think the, the issue has always been convincing the courts that actually, you know, these rights that, that Europeans have, they will be respected um, when data is transferred to, to other places around the world. And it's, a, it's about convincing them to uphold the mechanisms that the European Commission and others are actually approving to allow these transfers to occur. So I do think in the long run, we're going to arrive at a solution, but uh, it might be um, a, a bit of a a long haul before we get there. I don't know if Vivek has a view on that or not. Yeah, Oliver, I'm. Uh, I'm. I think I'd, I'd be delighted to share your hope, um, but I, I perhaps don't share the optimism that it will get easier. Uh, my my prior optimism has only proven me wrong to date, as it has only become more complicated with each given year and each given set of developments. All right, so. Vivek, you're obviously you're um, advising uh, U.S. companies uh, regularly on on how to deal with this increasing set of complications and developments coming out of the EU and the UK. What what can you tell us about what you're telling 
uh, these businesses? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it, it may be helpful to kind of just contextualize a little bit and step back. You know, this is not the first time that companies have had to undertake uh, contracting or recontracting uh, for privacy or data protection. I, I think that for companies writ large, um, the first real big wake up call um, was uh, was GDPR, which obviously came into effect in 2018. Um, you know, many of these requirements that, you know, GDPR had in place, uh, whether it was uh, to implement adequate tools for cross-border transfers, whether they be standard contractual clauses or otherwise, had existed for quite a while since the Data Protection Directive. But uh, companies across industry started to wake up to it in 2018 or in the run-up to 2018 with GDPR and the significant penalties that uh, were, were called for by the regulation. Following that, uh, you know, fairly significant exercise uh, of, of undertaking uh, uh, model clauses or uh, thinking more critically about your cross-border data transfer solutions and implementing and, and developing uh, DPAs or data processing addendums uh, and implementing them with vendors or other counterparties. Uh, companies were kind of set back on their heels uh, by the enactment of the CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act, which came into effect in, in January 2020, uh, and used essentially a new taxonomy and framework for uh, entities. Uh, instead of the controller processor distinction, it used a different set of terms of business and service provider or business and third party. And companies had to undertake, again, an analysis of how they were going to contract and interact with uh, the other businesses in their ecosystem and how they were going to classify them and what terms they were going to subject them to. Um, so I view this as, as kind of a, a, another point on the continuum, uh, but an important milestone because uh, now that the SECs have been updated, now that we actually have language that tracks GDPR's requirements, uh, and we have some, call it 21st century thought, put into uh, how to set this out and what kind of things to have companies actually undertake other than kind of the rote filling out of these forms, uh, including some really, I think, positive developments in terms of uh, having companies actually list out the types of personal data uh, and the security measures that are used to protect it, which provides both forward-looking value as well as retrospective value to understand your relationships. Companies, in, in our experience and our clients, have used this as a, as a strategic inflection point to think critically about how they can come up with a set of agreements and a, and a new set of templates that they can use to contract with counterparties going forward. And in consideration of frameworks that have been enacted and are coming into effect, for example, California's replacement privacy statute, the CPRA, as well as new laws in the United States and Virginia and Colorado, uh, and also in consideration of other uh, frameworks that may be applicable, such as in Brazil, the LGPD, uh, and other frameworks that are coming into effect around the world. Uh, so this is something where uh, we've been working with a number of clients and we've been thinking really critically about how do we streamline this global body of law into a document that can accompany uh, for example, the model clauses or SCCs, uh, but really set out what the company's vision, values, and requirements are uh, and how it seeks to obligate or would seek to represent itself as obligated to compliance with these frameworks uh, and also to use these tools to help educate counterparties in their ecosystem, ones that may not be familiar with the suite of obligations, as to what they're actually signing on to and what they actually are expected to do. We, we know this is exhausting. Uh, you know, this is this is, as I said, you know, round three or round four in, uh, in a multi year exercise. It feels like once you have just completed uh, your round of contracting or made significant progress, there's a new law that you need to comply with um, or a new set of re requirements. But I think that this is uh, a really great inflection point, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, we're, we're hoping and, and helping clients use it as such and hope that the terms that we come up with now and the language that's put in place can be durable for, uh, let's say, at least a few years. Okay, so tell us a little bit more, Vivek, about things that uh, companies can do to 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 make their uh, data protection agenda more, you know, forward looking. Some of the the uh, wrinkles in the new laws that they can try to uh, steer around and get ahead of. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think first and foremost, we're seeing a strong. Uh, demand from clients to to make these things shorter, uh, which we're we're fully aligned around, um, and and so what that requires in the first instance is for a company to begin to understand its own posture. First, 
what laws are likely applicable to it, what are the re relevant frameworks, uh, as well as how is it positioned? Does it have, uh, is it primarily uh, in, the, in the context of contracting with vendors? Is it a service provider itself? Uh, how does it interact with its customers? Is it a B2B business or a B2C business? Uh, and that drives uh, a lot of how you think about and structure what I would call the default templates that a company uses. Uh, and with regards to the, the legal frameworks, the first thing we seek to do is use the DPA as a compliance with applicable laws framework. Uh, you know, you can, but you don't need to list out every single potential applicable law. What I think is important is to capture in a DPA the really key relevant requirements of these legal frameworks. We have seen some uh, the, the, the shoots of harmonization uh, in laws like Colorado and Virginia that take uh, language and taxonomies from GDPR and apply them. Uh, we see certain other harmonization happening with, with the concept of, of the sale of personal information under CCPA also being adopted into Virginia and Colorado laws. And we see new concepts such as a consent only framework for the processing of uh, collection and processing of sensitive data in Virginia. And so what we try to do is we seek to grab these highlights from uh, various laws and encapsulate them in, in these DPAs so that entities that are subject to them, the entities that are reading them on the, on the receiving end, begin to understand more clearly what these frameworks actually require in practice and what the counterparty that is sending them the actual agreement expects them to comply with. Um, and so these are used in part to obligate vendors or other parties to uh, certain requirements, but they're also an education tool. They're also helping those uh, the recipients, the vendors, the processors, for example, understand what they're actually required to do uh, because the, the new model clauses, uh, you know, which I, I think has many significant benefits, uh, still are dense and long and complicated and not written in a plain English way that helps uh, people understand what they're actually signing on to do. So that's where our, our highest priority is, is using as clear language as we can to educate our, not only our clients, but their partners and their counterparties about what they're actually required to do under these new frameworks. Uh, and we've seen a lot of traction in that. We've seen uh, companies that are on the receiving end of some of these agreements uh, beginning to understand and rigorously assess whether the actual data that they are handling is being done uh, and protected in a manner that is called for in these agreements. So steering the conversation back to, to Europe more specifically, do, do you have any um, uh, specific guidance for how companies can best structure their forms to work with the new standard contractual clauses, the, the, the well, what we sometimes call the model clauses out of the yeah. EU? Yeah, I, I'm going to uh, look to partner with Oliver to answer this question. Um, but what the way that we think about it from a, a global DPA perspective is to think about a section for what we might consider, uh, quote, restricted transfers, or you can think of them as, as transfers outside the EEA, if you'd like. Um, and that basically incorporates by reference and says, if there is personal data being transferred cross border in a manner that would you know, trigger such an obligation, uh, we're gonna staple on the model clauses and the various annexes uh, to be completed. Uh, and this is a requirement that is not just for Europe. There are, you know, new model clauses that are being implemented in other jurisdictions around the world uh, to facilitate cross-border data transfers, and where it's only likely to be an increasing trend. Uh, but the way that, that I think about it uh, is that this is, uh, and, and I'll defer to Oliver to speak a little bit to this, uh, some of the annexes in the model clauses uh, really provide businesses with a great opportunity to understand the personal data that's transferred as part of that agreement, as well as the substantive security protections. Uh, Oliver, uh, over to you to, to speak a little bit about how that can help companies and, and how that's actually, a, at least in my uh, experience, been a valuable exercise for people to undertake. Yeah, sure. So I think um, one area where I think uh, the, the SCCs do advance uh, the, the conversation is with respect to the annexes where you have to fill out, uh, at least in the controller to processor module, details about how the personal data is actually going to be used. And, um, and that raises questions about how you're actually going to get that information. How are you going to sit down with the business teams to actually fill that out? Is that the exporter's responsibility? Is that the importer's responsibility? 
I think what is, what is good about the um, enhanced information that has to be provided here is that it does mean that the parties have to get together to sort of move all this in a bit more detail. And it helps both parties understand what the ambit of the, the data transfer actually is. I guess security is, is another area um, where there is enhanced information that has to be provided in, uh, in the standard contractual clauses. Um, again, um, you know, this might involve the security folks sort of sitting down and working out what security measures are actually going to be adopted, or it might be something that is done as part of a more general security assessment of the imports, and there might be a link to more general wording about security measures that the vendor takes more broadly that can be referred to here. But again, it's a good opportunity for the parties to get together and, and work out what security measures are actually be applied to this data. And Oliver, I, I think that you, you raise another good point, which, which we should have raised earlier, is that not all of this is a controller to processor relationship, right? As companies assess their actual role in the ecosystem, there are many, for example, controller to controller relationships uh, and this is uh, another opportunity for, for those entities to figure out what their data flows are and understand it, particularly in the controller controller DPA context, uh, what obligations they would seek to make mutual uh, and how uh, rigorous and how above and beyond uh, the formal obligations imposed by the law they're seeking to not only commit their counterparties to, but commit themselves to as well. Because in uh, a controller to controller context, often, uh, mutuality is expected by both parties, uh, especially when data flows are truly two way. Well, these are great, great insights uh, and tips. Uh, we thank you very much, Vivek and Oliver. Um, appreciate your coming in today. Uh, listeners, if you have any questions about today's episode or an idea for an episode you'd like to hear about, anything related to technology transactions and the law, please email us at Tech transactions at mayorbrown.com. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this program. You can subscribe on all major podcasting platforms. To learn about other Mayor Brown audio programming, visit mayorbrown.com slash podcasts. Thanks for listening.